Good evening. Everybody and their big fat mama has played Gary's Mod, or Gmod. Gmod is famous for being the first game to ever let you roleplay as My Little Ponies and not-so-friendly people, hide from a scary dark figure, print money and sell hard drugs, or run away from people as a banana. I mean, honestly, it'd probably be faster to list the things you can't do in Gmod, really. Anyway, some of you might know that Gmod is actually based on an underrated game nobody's ever heard of called Half-Life 2. But a lot less people know that Gmod is not the only E-Mod if you catch my drift. Before Gmod, there was JB Mod, which I already did a video about, so I won't go into too much depth on, but for the most part, it was just an earlier and worse version of the same premise. Half-Life 2 with a fizz gun to drag ragdolls around the map with. You might have also heard of M Mod, an overhaul of Half-Life 2 that basically gives it Call of Duty guns and Michael Bay explosions. If you browse through modding sites, you can find a plethora of creations where guys have basically just made Gmod again, except named it after themselves. B Mod, T Mod, C Mod, there's all species out there. But more important to me in my childhood than any of these other Gmod siblings was a Japanese mod that offered me just as many, if not more, thrills than Gmod itself. One that never gets the love and commemoration it deserves, despite technically coming before Gmod, and also being, if you could believe it, even crazier in some ways. I am of course referring to S-Mod. <laughs> This mod is one of the coolest and most absurd video game mods ever created, but it's a pain in the ass to get your hands on nowadays because pretty much every official download for it has been knocked offline for over 10 years now, and there's such a huge list of unofficial versions floating around that even if you want to get into S mod, it's hard to know where to start. That's also probably why it hasn't been talked about all that much on YouTube, despite at one point being damn near just as popular as Gmod itself. In fact, it is pretty hard to find solid answers on what S mod was created to be or where it actually came from. So I crawled through a few archives of lost gaming forms in other languages to try and get the story straight myself. From what I can tell, Super Mod, or S Mod, was one of the earliest Half-Life 2 mods ever created. The first Bare Bones release actually came out a week before the original version of Gary's Mod, and it grew to popularity around the same time as our beloved Ragdoll Humping Game. Unlike Gary's Mod, however, nobody actually has any idea who the hell made Super Mod. Everywhere online dating back to 2005 credits the mod to a single anonymous Japanese guy under the pseudonym Sakusha Desu, which translates in English to just the author. I seriously cannot find a single trace of this guy's real identity anywhere else on the internet, and it seems this was by design. S-Mod started out as nothing but a slight overhaul of Half-Life 2's combat, which has since the game's release been critiqued online as being mediocre. However, it quickly evolved to become a much more interesting and elaborate project, and something much closer to what you'd probably imagine in your head when hearing about a Japanese total conversion for Half-Life 2. S-Mod also functioned as a base for other Half-Life modders to pick up and tweak to their heart's desire, and wound up becoming something of a lightning rod for all kinds of other utterly insane custom Half-Life 2 content, much like Gmod did. This flexibility I'm describing is the main reason there's so many versions of S mod floating around online nowadays. Also, while I was scouring the old defunct website for this mod, I found a very peculiar note from its author. Perhaps this mod is not for the following. People with no spirit of inquiry. People who cannot control themselves. People with no interest in single player. People who don't love Gordon. Now, getting your hands on S-Mod in the modern day is pretty damn tricky. There used to be an internet forum called Snooch that hosted a standalone version of S-Mod that ran outside of Steam, but the site seems to have gone offline within the last couple years, because of course it has. Thankfully, you can still find various re-uploads around the internet on sites like ModDB, and there's even a few Good Samaritans who have gone out of their way to port and remake the mod using the latest version of Half-Life 2 on Steam. I prefer to use the old ass version though. It just has more... Soul. The last official version of S-Mod was released by Sakushidesu on June 13th, 2008, and it's called S-Mod 40A. So before I get into S-Mod Tactical or any of the other juicy spin-offs, let's kick things off with the OG. By the way, this video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, who have once again shaken up the world of men's grooming with the release of the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, featuring the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra Electric Trimmer. The Lawnmower 5.0 features next-gen dual skin-safe blade heads, as well as an upgraded trimmer blade and interchangeable foil blade for enhanced performance. Its mission is to leave you with that irresistibly smooth, bare finish as it moves softly across your skin, snatching even the finest hairs. If you've shopped with Manscaped before, you might notice that this trimmer is a tribute 
tribute to their classic products, retaining their most beloved features. A rechargeable lithium-ion battery, RPM technology for top-notch performance, a travel lock for seamless portability, USB-C charging, and it's even still waterproof. The Performance Package 5.0 Ultra also comes with the Crop Preserver and Crop Soother, and even two free gifts. First being the Boxers 2.0, which are not just any regular pair of boxers. They're designed for ultimate comfort and style, and come with the Jewel Pouch. And second, there's the Shed 2.0 Travel Bag. So head over to manscaped.com and get your hands on the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra today. When you use my promo code Richter, you'll get 20% off plus free international shipping and two gifts. That's 20% off plus free shipping and two free gifts with promo code Richter at manscaped.com. Trust me when I say your balls will thank you. Anyway, back to the video. The first thing you'll notice once you get SMOD 40 running is that it has a very unique swag. The mod doesn't take itself very seriously, as you'll see later, but the art on the main menu and the general vibe that accompanies pretty much every single version of SMOD is seriously snazzy. There's a list of trippy, surreal, grainy images that the game randomly picks from to display on the main menu every time you launch it, and the whole game just has this weird, mythic 2000s form aesthetic. I don't know how else to describe it. The second thing you'll probably notice is the abundance of weird options and new features. Pretty much every version of SMOD you can find will have a new assortment of settings and keybinds to tweak, some more than others. For one, the mod introduces bullet time, straight out of the matrix, to let you slow the game down and go for precision shots against your enemies. This is actually really cool because SMOD also replaces all of Half-Life 2's hitscan guns with ones that fire physical projectiles. So you can actually see your bullets flying through the air towards Kleiner's stupid face. Because yeah, this mod is so hardcore it even lets you softlock your game by killing the friendly NPCs. This is not your dad's Half-Life 2. I'm turning Breen into a fucking cherry lime made from Sonic. You can also tweak how the bullet time works using either console commands or, in some versions of SMOD, a little setting on the main menu that lets you change it to emulate the bullet time systems of other games like Max Payne or Fear. It's pretty cool. For two, the mod introduces the Gordon Kick. I believe Duke Nukem 3D was the first shooter game to introduce a first person kick, and while it's never caught on as a mechanic because it's a bit goofy, in SMOD it is hilariously broken and a ton of fun. You can literally kick someone to death and then punt their body until it explodes into a giant web of giblets, or save on gas the mud skipper by just fucking hoofing it through the map Fred Flintstone style. There's seriously so many satisfying applications of the Gordon kick throughout the game. Like kicking a head crab out of the air, putting those annoying city scanners in their place, or just for fun, punting a prop into the skies like a fucking Dragon Ball character. One of my favorite things about SMOD, though, is that it adds iron sights. Now, I know there are some purists who really hate the idea of Half-Life ever having stupid-ass baby Kawa Duty iron sights, but are you really gonna sit there and tell me you never wanted to peer down the giant red dot sight on the Half-Life 2 SMG? Just look at it. It's practically begging for it. And yeah, it's pretty awesome. Some of the other weapons were just clearly not made for it, though. The AR-2 iron sight looks abysmal. For the most part, the ability to aim down sights is just a cosmetic change, but it does make the game feel pretty different mechanically, especially in conjunction with the new gore system that lets you turn people into big steamy clouds of blood. Half-Life 2 exchanged the big splody gibbs of Half-Life 1 for the subtle satisfaction of ragdoll physics. But here in SMOD we get the best of both worlds, and it's lovely. On top of changes to the game mechanics, SMOD also does quite a lot to change up the Half-Life 2 campaign itself, and even the cast of enemies and friends you'll encounter throughout it. You'll come across some pretty bizarre sights if you play the game the whole way through. For example, in the iconic pick up that can scene. Instead of a soda can, it's a gas can, and when the Metro Cop goes to tip it over, he instead lights himself on fire. Kleiner's lab has companion cubes in it and all kinds of other surprises. Is there anything else different in here? <laughs> I guess so. Halfway through Water Hazard, the game just says fuck you and makes you drive the buggy instead of the boat, which is just straight up bewildering on a first playthrough. And there's even something I wish that all games had. Inexplicable Christmas content. If you boot SMOD up on Christmas, or just make your computer think you did, all the characters get outfitted with Santa hats. Even G-Man. If that's not enough, Gordon even gets a special Christmas gift. A golden crowbar. It shoots these rapid-fire energy beams that easily massacre any NPC in its path, and needless to say, it's very overpowered. Speaking of NPCs, they've been livened up a bit too. The Rebels in Combine throughout the campaign not only make use of new weapons, we'll get more into those in a second, but there's actually been more enemies injected into the levels through some kind of scripting black magic. A lot of the time, this makes the game harder and more enticing. Especially for someone like me who's played Half-Life 2 so many times I know it like the back of my hand. Other times, it's just kind of hilarious because the game often spawns them in downright ridiculous spots. There's also some more puzzling changes. There's this squad of friendly combine you randomly encounter in Ravenholm, hound eyes ported right from Half-Life 1 you'll encounter in the canals, and these weird freakish mutations of combine elites called combine aces, who appear throughout the game and jump giant heights and just kind of look absurd. There's also headcrabless 
variants of all the regular zombies, which is a bit odd. Probably the most bizarre enemy, however, is this scary-ass bald guy who charges you with an unsettling speed walk and is actually really startling at times. Moving on from the NPCs, it's time to address the elephant in the room. The thing I'm sure every S-Mod fan has been waiting for me to talk about since this video started. The weapons. S-Mod has so many weapons that I think it might be literally impossible to discover all of them in a single regular playthrough. And some of those spin-off mods pile on even more. Thankfully, there's no shame in just launching a map and using the give-all weapons cheat to mess around. In fact, I recommend doing just that. It's something of an S-Mod tradition to load up the train station and use Impulse 101 to terrorize the poor City 17 denizens with bananas and shit. Getting into the specifics of S-Mod's arsenal, there's of course the default Half-Life 2 weapons, which all return, but some of which have been slightly retuned. If you're someone who thinks Half-Life 2's weapons suck, this is your lucky day. The biggest punching bags of the base game arsenal, the SMG, pistol, and AR-2, have been given much beefier firing sounds. And as mentioned, they now have iron sights and in general just feel a little bit different than they did in vanilla Half-Life 2. You can also now throw your crowbar at enemies, which can be really fucking funny. As for the new weapons, let's start with probably my favorite one, the shovel. I believe this weapon is a reference to Postal 2, but to be frank, S-Mod's version is way cooler. It is genuinely the most satisfying melee weapon I've used in any FPS game, maybe ever. Once you get your hands on this thing in Ravenholm, chances are you are not going to want to use anything else for the rest of your playthrough. You can combo its swings to thwack anything in your path with ease, and the secondary attack lets you pivot it forward and explode your enemies on a whim. It also makes this hilarious clunk noise. The player also gets their hands on on that cool special gun that Alex has seen using throughout the series. You come across it in the canals and it has separate firing modes for single, burst, and fully automatic firing. How about a box of soybeans? I'm not making this up. S-Mod lets you find a box of soy and pelt it at your enemies, which if you didn't know is actually a really effective way to win online arguments, I've discovered. Also in the canals, you can come across this strange laser gun using the AR2 model that kind of functions like the attack the stalker NPCs use. You can use it to pierce through your enemies and its alt fire slowly chips out devastating explosions, but you don't get a lot of ammo for it, so it's unfortunately not very useful. One weapon I do love to use is the new AK-47. It takes AR2 ammo and it's a bit rare but it's viscerally satisfying in a way that neither the base SMG nor AR2 ever were. You really feel like you're blowing Combine soldiers you really feel like you're blowing Combine soldiers away with this thing, and it's one of the highlights of the entire S-Mod arsenal in my opinion. Speaking of highlights, the Car 98K is not only my favorite gun in S-Mod, but also one of my favorite FPS weapons of all time. Once you pick it up, there's basically no reason to put it down unless you run out of ammo, and even then it has a one-hit kill bayonet attached to it, making it probably the most roundly useful weapon in the entire game. This thing straight up punctures enemies at pretty much any distance, and the sound it makes is really satisfying. The model S-Mod uses for the Car 98K is ripped from the 2003 Half-Life mod Day of Defeat, and you'd think it would look bad and out of place with the rest of Half-Life 2's arsenal, but it blends in much better than you'd think. You can find it in the canals, and honestly it makes me wish one of these would have really appeared in Half-Life 2 or its episodes. There's actually another World War II gun ported from Day of Defeat that you can find in the canals as well, being the M3, or Grease Gun. This one isn't quite as broken or exciting as the Car 98K, but it still has a really nice chunky feeling. I quite like it. Returning from Half-Life 1 is the h and MP5. This time though, it's silenced and doesn't alert enemies. It still has a grenade launcher though, and it would probably be a really fun gun if it didn't sound like utter dog shit. There's also the Sniperskaya Vindovka Dragonova, better known as just the Dragonov or SVD sniper rifle. This gun is ported from another Half-Life 1 mod called Firearms, and somehow looks even worse than the Day of Defeat ones in my opinion. But it fills the scoped sniper rifle shaped hole in the Half-Life 2 arsenal decently well, and can still be fun to land headshots with. That is, if you can shoot through the annoying aim sway. And finally, for the explosives, there's motion sensor bombs, which are kind of like the trip mines from Half-Life 1, or the slams from Half-Life 2 Deathmatch, as well as an AM. M14 incendiary grenade. It's just a flammable version of the regular frag grenade, but it's pretty cool actually, and again makes me wonder why something like this didn't appear in one of the Half-Life 2 spin-offs. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, come on Richter, these weapons aren't even that bizarre or Japanese. Some kind of clickbait that was. Well, young Padawan, that's where the cheat weapons come into play. There's a bunch of even kookier weapons in S-Mod that you can only get your hands on using cheat commands, and I would be remiss not to mention them. For starters, the mod lets you play around with a bunch of weapons that were present in the Half-Life 2 beta leak, but act 
text from the final game. There's this early version of the Fizz Gun, which is more like the JB mod one than the G mod one, and therefore it kind of just sucks. There's a buggy weapon called the Strider Cannon that is so powerful it often straight up crashes your game. The Gauss Cannon from Half-Life 1 makes its unceremonious return using the SMG model for some reason. There's a very devastating flamethrower, and even a flare gun you can use to make the combine bust it down sexual style. You can get a pair of scissors straight out of Postal 2 and chuck them at your enemies. There's an alt fire that throws three of them at once, and that combined with the ricochet mechanics can quickly create pure chaos. One of the more eccentric weapons is the UMD Spin Fuser. If you didn't know, the UMD is a game disc format made for the PSP. Based on the wallpaper, this is apparently a PSP Gordon brought back from Black Mesa that G-Man let him keep for some reason. I guess to keep him entertained during his 20 year long stasis. Though apparently he or somebody else has jury rigged it to turn those UMDs into a form of explosive ammo you can launch out of the damn thing. I'm a big fan of this one. Using a PSP to kill people is pretty hilarious, and the lore implications are amusing as well. I especially like this caveman-ass animation when you press the alt fire. Gordon just starts jamming his finger into the square button and seemingly gets frustrated at the fact that Thing can't play games anymore. There's a weapon simply called the Stuff Launcher that lets you suck up any person, prop, or entity in the game and spew it out as a physics projectile. I recall there was a similar weapon in Fallout 3 called the Rocket Launcher, though that one was a lot more limited. This one lets you pelt dumpsters at people, ravage the world with watermelons or clones of Dr. Kleiner, spam broken versions of obscure entities until the game crashes, or even single-handedly repopulate the world, suppression field be damned. It's kind of surprising to me that a variant of this weapon was never officially implemented in Gmod. It would have fit in perfectly. If you're an old enough viewer to have ever played Worms, you might recall that that game has explosive banana bombs. S-Mod brings these banana bombs to Half-Life 2 in the form of the Sweet Banana, which are remotely detonated banana mines with infinite ammo, and they're quite a lot of fun. If you're like me and always found the bug bait to be an underwhelming part of Half-Life 2's arsenal, maybe the antlion spawner will be more your speed. Instead of throwing weird slime balls to summon and control the antlions, fuck it, why not just throw the antlions directly? You can throw as many as you want, just like the bananas, and you can even use the right click to throw an antlion guard. It's actually kind of crazy how easily some of these weapons completely break Half-Life 2 once you get your hands on them. On top of the new incendiary grenade and motion sensor mine, there's also the trap hop wire and vortex hop wire, which are two very similar throwable energy weapons that I believe were cut from Half-Life 2 and Half-Life 2 Episode 1 respectively. They're both really unstable and strange, usually sucking up and jittering physics props around and generally creating chaos, sometimes crashing the game. I have to assume these were left as cheat-only weapons for a reason, much like this portable version of the airboat gun, which is really boring and useless. And finally, probably the most perplexing weapon in all of S-Mod, the Magic Hello Kitty Wand, otherwise known as Gordon's Magical Stick. Did I mention this mod is Japanese? The Hello Kitty wand casts these bolt things that zap around the map and are actually pretty fun. Much like the scissors, the wand's alt fire spams a load of these projectiles and can cause some serious lag. And it's definitely one of the most ridiculous weapons I've ever used in a video game. So yeah, looking at all the changes and additions to Half-Life 2's enemy and weapon rosters as a whole, it's safe to say S-Mod works really hard to dial up the comic violence and absurdity of Half-Life 2. And I think most people would agree that's the project's main draw. However, S-Mod also comes with a set of custom missions. Basically, the game uses the same system it used to inject extra NPCs into the main campaign, to also inject enemy NPCs into various multiplayer maps, and create these small, self-contained single-player quests. This custom mission system was apparently really easy for modders to work with as well, which is why there's tons of extra fan-made S-Mod mission packs floating around online. From what I can tell, there are four types of these missions, the first being survival. In this mode, the game basically just drops you into a random map and says, fuck it, survive. Hordes of enemies and ammo will spawn endlessly as you're placed in a theoretically infinite shootout. Some of these survival maps even give you money for your kills, which you can then use to buy new weapons like in COD Zombies. I really like this one mission called Clocks. It's an overrun church on an isolated island with a functional clock tower and a really interesting mystical vibe. Or how about Garrison? A long badass holdout against every single kind of combine unit that seriously tested my Half-Life 2 skills. A Starship Troopers inspired map where you defend against waves of antlions. Or Motel, this moody zombie survival map that slowly whittles away at you and your squad of friendly combine until you're the last man standing, mowing down hordes of freaky undead until your final breath. It's great fun. There's another mission type called Item Recovery, where you're placed into a level and not allowed to leave until you collect a series of objectives. My personal favorite of these is this one map called Equilibre. It's a partially destroyed shanty town built on a bunch of rocks at sea with this really cool foggy atmosphere. You arrive at the town via its dock, and you're tasked with finding more gas for your airboat. Balancing along the town's narrow creaky walkways and bombed out houses, you've got to fight and evade zombies to earn your ticket home. Ever since I played this map years back, it's become somewhat of a hyper fixation of mine for some reason. 
reason. I'll throw more info about it on screen here for the people who care. There's a mode called Hostage Rescue, which transforms Counter-Strike source maps into single-player operations where you have to go in and try to rescue civilians from Combine Troopers. I, for one, am very grateful that SMOD gives me an opportunity to experience the beautiful aesthetics of classic Counter-Strike games without having to deal with 35-year-old Eastern Europeans emasculating me. You're a pussy gay. And finally, there's Elimination, which is a mode where you're dropped into a map and given a handful of high-ranking targets to track down and eliminate. Probably the most memorable of these is a mission called CSC Desert, in which you're tasked with wiping out a bunch of terrorist commanders, really Half-Life 2 characters, who are all scattered about on a faithful remake of the map from the original Fallout. Look, there's even Shady Sands, or Sandy Shades. These custom missions offer a rich arcadey side experience to SMOD, a lot like the Mercenaries mode in Resident Evil, and I remember them keeping me entertained for hours as a kid anytime my internet would go out. To put it simply, SMOD 40A on its own offers a beyond impressive amount of content for an early Half-Life 2 mod. That being said though, this video still wouldn't do justice to the project's legacy if I didn't dedicate at least a little bit of time to SMOD's massive family of spin-offs. Now, there are like a million bajillion spin-off mods based on SMOD, and if I tried to list them all, we'd seriously be here all day. So instead, I'm just gonna try to give flowers to the ones that I think are most memorable or interesting. The first of which has got to be SMOD Tactical. SMOD Tactical basically completely transforms Half-Life 2 into a somewhat realistic and quite challenging tactical shooter. According to the SMOD wiki, it started as nothing more than a simple weapon pack, but it slowly evolved into an all-out realism mod that surprisingly still maintains somewhat of a cult following to this day. Playing SMOD Tactical really feels almost nothing like playing Half-Life 2, even though you're literally fighting Half-Life 2 enemies on usually Half-Life 2 levels. This is because everything down to the way your character moves and shoots has been totally redesigned. Most notably, there's now this weird swaying free aim instead of your regular mouse controls, and while it's a bit disorienting at first, it's actually really cool using it to lean around corners and shit. It basically turns the game into a completely different experience. This mod also has no health bar and no crosshair, which creates a surprising amount of immersion and makes the aim down sight system much more useful than it was in base S mod. The enemies are also much more aggressive and rush you more often, but thankfully there's a somewhat forgiving health regeneration system where you press a button to bend down and cover and bandage yourself. S mod Tactical also has its own set of missions ranging from zombie shootouts to clearing out terrorist dens, and frankly it's a really cool and unique experience. If the original S mod was Half-Life 2 emulating Postal 2, S mod Tactical is Half-Life 2 emulating Rainbow Six or maybe Call of Duty. One of the more strange SMOD spin-offs is Substance, an aesthetic overhaul of Half-Life 2 that redesigns it to look and sound like Metal Gear Solid. Now, I admittedly haven't played a single Metal Gear Solid game, sorry, but from what I can tell, this mod doesn't actually play anything like Metal Gear despite all the pizzazz. It just emulates the weapon roster and style, letting you play as a super speedy agent who zips around and kills the Combine with dual revolvers, tasers, and miniguns. It's definitely one of the more chaotic Half-Life 2 mods I've ever played though, that's for sure. At one point, there was apparently a mod for SMOD based on crisis called Cry Life. It was even popular enough to get some game articles written about it back in 2013, but I wasn't able to track down a download for it nowadays. Similarly, there's a mod called SMOD Outbreak, which I unfortunately could not get running. From the pictures though, it looks to be an apocalyptic, frenzied take on SMOD, focused around all kinds of crazy zombie enemy types and these new sci-fi versions of the game's factions. I'm a bit sad I couldn't try this one out. One thing SMOD never really had was multiplayer, which is something that a little-known project called SMOD Troopers tries to deliver. In this mod, you play as one of the few set classes and head out on missions with your friends to clear out enemy bases. And while it's a pretty unpolished and unstable experience, it makes me sad there aren't more classic co-op source engine experiences like it outside of Left 4 Dead. When you get to fighting antlions in this shit, it honestly feels like a strange knockoff of Helldivers 2. And finally, there's SMOD Redux, which from what I can tell is not only the most popular, but also probably the best way to experience SMOD in 2024. SMOD Redux is basically just a polished up version of SMOD 40A, but with a bunch of things tweaked for accessibility. First off, it actually runs through Steam, like a normal Half-Life mod. Second, it turns a lot of the esoteric console commands into settings you can tweak on the main menu, making it much easier to adjust things like bullet time and how the Gibbs system works. Third, it touches up some of SMOD 40's underbaked visuals. For example, the Goss Cannon, Flare Gun, Fizz Gun, Laser Rifle, and Flamethrower now have their own unique models instead of just reusing other weapon models from Half-Life 2. And finally, it adds in even more interesting custom weapons that fit right in with the rest of SMOD's kooky arsenal. A minigun, an M249, an M1 Garand, a grenade launcher, a CZ-52, a Deagle, dual pistols, Gordon's Fist, the MP40, a silenced M4A1, the OICW, a Golden 357, the Pulse Machine Gun from the Mounted Turrets, the P90, a Sawed-Off, a Jackhammer, and even a little sword. They even tweaked the weird NPCs. 
The friendly Combine soldiers are now Marines from Half-Life 1, which looks slightly out of place, but admittedly make more sense than the Combine slave androids somehow rebelling. Those strange jumping Combine Ace enemies have also been turned into the female Combine assassins from the Half-Life 2 beta, which is actually a pretty fitting change. S-Mod Redux basically feels like someone trying to build onto and flesh out the more ridiculous and unrefined parts of S-Mod to create something a little bit more presentable. And while it's technically not official, if you're looking to get into S-Mod, I can't say there's much of a better place to start than there. The download link to it will be in the description. Since S-Mod Redux runs through Steam, it also wasn't actually that hard to get it running on the Steam Deck. So if you see someone on the bus holding a weird gadget playing a game about throwing soybeans and bananas at men in gas masks, it's probably me. So, with all the content it provided and the cult following the mod had, how is it that so few people today care to talk about S-Mod? How exactly did this project fade into the obscurity it exists in today? Well, with the release of Half-Life 2 Episode 1 and 2 bringing engine changes, it seemed that a new version of S-Mod was going to need to be made to work across every Half-Life 2 game. The original author of S-Mod, Saku Shidesu, seemed to be working on a project built from the Half-Life 2 Episode 2 engine called S-Mod 2, complete with its own set of interesting visuals. Only three versions were ever released before the official site was abandoned and later closed though, and they weren't really anything to write home about. The anonymous author never came home with the milk. And when Valve rolled out the Steam Pipe update in 2013, which broke a huge amount of Half-Life 2 mods, pretty much every version of S-Mod was affected. I believe this is why the S-Mod standalone client was created, to salvage these old broken versions. Since S-Mod never really evolved into a professional effort in the way Gmod did, it never made its way onto Steam and thus is not particularly accessible. I took the opportunity to ask Gmod's creator Gary Newman about S-Mod, and while he distinctly remembers it, he told me that he never viewed it as much of a threat to Gmod given that it seemed to be mainly just for the lols. He also speculated that the creator might have been staying anonymous because he worked at a real game studio, which would explain why the art was so well done for its time. What stands of S-Mod today is a cool mod that's unfortunately now really annoying to set up and requires you to either use a hacky client or compromise on an unofficial remake slash port. For all those reasons, it's sort of been lost to time in the greater Source Engine community, which I find a bit disheartening. I think it's important to remember S-Mod, though. It's very special to me on a personal level, and it was a trailblazer that made way for an entire genre of video game mods we still see today. Brutal Doom, for example, wouldn't come out until six years later in 2010, and we still see S-Mod continue to inspire mechanics and mods like Half-Life 2 Overcharged and M-Mod to this day. And for all the impact S-Mod has had in the PC game modding scene, it's fascinating to me that nobody knows who actually made it. I'm not sure any mods designed to enhance the comic violence of a video game existed before S-Mod. Prior to Half-Life 2, most all shooter games including even Half-Life 1, already had some kind of gore system, so there was no real reason for people to consider creating hyper-violence mods for them. The juxtaposition of Half-Life 2's subtle, reserved, tasteful world with this cartoonish slapstick created a one-of-a-kind eclectic experience that I think is truly unforgettable. And it's kind of funny that, in a roundabout way, S-Mod cranking the ultra-violence knob up on Half-Life 2 to match Half-Life 1 has now inspired people to go back and revise Half-Life 1's violence even more with projects like Brutal Half-Life. To put a bow on it, S-Mod is still a unique and massively entertaining way to play Half-Life 2 for people who might be bored of the vanilla experience, and a cool little underworld for Half-Life 2 modding in general that I'm sad has mostly died. It's really a shame you have to pick up the pieces if you want to experience it in the modern age, and I feel like Saku Shidesu's work deserves better than to exist as a tiny footnote in the shadow of Gmod. It was a hallmark of a very different time in modding and gaming in general that I very much miss, and I had a great time revisiting it for this video. And no matter how far it fades into obscurity, I'll always have a soft spot for Gmod's bizarre Japanese brother. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed, subscribe for more, and have a good day.